Good morning. Hey, good to see you guys this morning. Hey, I want you to know we're in October, and it's beautiful out there. It's leaves, which reminds us that actually October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So many of you who know that Matt Furr is on sabbatical, those of you who are regulars, if you're not a regular, um, Matt Furr is, is our lead pastor, and he is on sabbatical right now. Uh, we got a couple more Sundays with this bald guy, but then after that, he's coming back. But I want you to know that even though he is gone, it would be great to appreciate him. So maybe you can write a note. You know, pastor appreciation could be anything. Could be a simple note, could be a gift card to Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or whatever your thing is or a restaurant or whatever you like to do for your pastor, this is that month. But I also want to remind you, that Joe is also a pastor. Joe is in uh, our associate pastor, and he's around, and we need to appreciate him also. So if you guys, just as a, as a simple reminder for you guys, just want to let you know that it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and even though Matt is on sabbatical, I think he would appreciate your appreciation. So just know you can send everything right here to the church, and the church will get that to him, I am sure. All right? Before we go in, I'd love to pray. I'd love to do something a little bit. We used to do this back in the day. We're going to do it again today. This is not to embarrass anybody, but if you feel like at some level you need prayer, at some level you feel like, man, I just would like specific prayer, I'm not going to ask you what that prayer request is. I'm not going to ask you, but I would love to pray for you specifically right now. And in fact, the rest of us would love to come around you and pray with you also, if we can, if you would allow us. So if you would like me to pray for you, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand simply. We got people, yep. Yeah. If there's somebody close to this person, if you feel comfortable, you can go over to them, put your hand on them. You can go ahead and stand up and move towards them if you want. If you just want to kind of put your hand out towards them so that they can just sense, you know, you're praying with them in that space, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to raise my hand too. We're all going to pray together right now. Here we go. I'm praying for us, all right? Lord God, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would guide us, that you would help us discern what you're doing in our life, help us to keep active in what's happening and, and what you're doing. And Lord God, help us to be sensitive today to your word. We take a moment and we pause to listen. Speak to us clearly now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We're talking about becoming. Becoming is this idea that God is doing something in our life. That God is actually doing something all the time in our life. And most of the time, we're just not paying attention to it, right? We've talked about this idea that we have the five senses that are in front of us. That which we see, taste, touch, feel, feel, hear, all those senses. We sort of are in that space. But we're not focused on the spiritual sense of what God is doing in our life. Let me ask you this question. How do you measure spiritual progress in your life? Think about that for a minute. I mean, if God is doing something in us, if, 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 if there is something that is happening in our life constantly, how do we measure what God is doing in our life? Spiritually speaking, how do we measure? We measure things all the time in the physical realm. In the physical realm, we're constantly doing that, right? I just had my anniversary last weekend. How many of you have an anniversary this month? That's a friendly reminder. How many of you have an anniversary next month? That's your friendly reminder, all right? Anniversaries every year. We remember. How many of you have a birthday this month? Happy birthday to you. Yes, I can see you're jumping up and down. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, right? We measure birthdays. We measure anniversaries. There's all these things that we measure. How many of you, parents, raise your hand. How many of you have a door frame or a wall in your house where you have measured your children? Raise your hand so I can see it. Yeah, look at all these hands. Yes, you measure it. You measure it, right? You just, there's something physically that you measure. How many of you, we do, how many of you 
buy a Christmas ornament every year to symbolize the year that you're in. Look at this. All these Physically, we measure things all the time. We're constantly measuring stuff. We're constantly looking and seeing our physical life, how it's actually moving, what's happening in that space. My question to you is, how do you measure your spiritual life? Do you measure your spiritual life? I mean, this message is a reminder to remember. This message is a reminder to remember. It really is a reminder that actually we need to remember to memorialize our life, our journey with Christ. We need to make sure that we are actually walking in that space continually. Actually, I think that most believers are believing agnostics. You say, what does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. If I asked you right now, when was the last time you saw God work in your life? Like, literally you said, you can go, it was on this date. It was, it was at this day. I remember like it was, it was right here. Was it yesterday? Was it last week? Was it last month? Was it last year? Was it years ago? I ask that question frequently to people. You know what happens typically? They're like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember. It was like uh, way, back, way back over here. Spiritual agnostic. We believe in God. We just don't think that he's actively working in our life. We believe that he's there. We got fire insurance. We're not going to go to the lake of fire. We're not going to go to hell. We believe, but we're spiritually agnostic because we, we just don't remind ourselves, we don't set up memorials for what God is doing in our life. We have no way to measure what God is doing in our life. If I ask you what your birthday is, you know right away. If I ask you, when's the last time God worked in your life? Really, it's hard. So we have to push the physical out of the way, bring the spiritual in front of us, and create a track that helps us remember what God is doing. If we don't, what is the outcome? The outcome is going, well, I don't know if I've seen God work lately. I don't feel like I'm hearing God in my life. I I don't feel like there's something that's happening in my life where God is speaking to me. In fact, I can't remember the last time. Or if I can, it was a long time ago. We need to remember lest we forget. Let me say that again. We need to remember lest we forget that God is working in our life every day. But the only way we're going to bring that to the surface and understand the progression of what's happening in our life is if we take a moment And memorialize it. Now listen, we're talking, that's important on an individual basis. It's even more important if you think about it in a leadership situation. In a situation where you, as an influencer, a leader, a person who has influence, as you do it in your life. Again, last week, grandparents influence parents. Parents influence kids, but kids influence parents. Kids influence grandparents. Parents influence grandparents. We also influence neighbors, community, the work on a lateral level. So in the family line there is, and as a leader in a family line, we need to remember. Some of you, I won't ask for a show of hands on this, but some of you actually celebrate, I know this, some people actually celebrate the day that they came to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Some people actually celebrate that on the calendar. This is the day I came to know the Lord. It's their spiritual birthday. Some people actually go back to the place where they had it or, or, or they remember the place where they came to know the Lord. Or maybe there was a significant moment in their life where they, were, where, where they felt like it was a, a call on their life or something that happened in their life and they can remember that. 
like it was crystal clear. What I'm trying to do is help us remember lest we forget. Because even as we lead our children, even as we lead our grandchildren, it's important for us to help them understand that God is active in our life. He's not just there. I'm not a believing agnostic. He's not just there and not functioning in this world. No, he is there and actively working in our life. Joshua, we're in the book of Joshua right now, and Joshua shares with us a little bit about this. In a moment here, in a moment in time, he takes an opportunity by direction of God now, just to refresh our memory kind of to where we were in the, in the story of, of Joshua, we started last week with this one thing. Moses is dead. Joshua is now the leader. There's a pep talk that's happening in the tent. And Joshua comes out of that pep talk and says, pack your bags. In three days, we're going into the promised land. Something that they had been hearing about for centuries that actually Many people, including Moses, had failed to enter into the promised land. It was death, devastation. Every family was impacted by this. And in a moment of sheer obedience, he just said, we're going in today. In three days. If you follow the story, we're going to skip forward just a little bit. But basically what happens is he goes out three days, and so there's preparations that are made. Everybody gets ready. They pack their bags. They get themselves ready. The Jordan River's right there. It's this moment of anticipation. There is the river. Part of the question that's happening in people's minds is, how are we going to cross that river? How are we going to actually physically get across the water? There's no bridge there's no highway. How are we going to do that? Don't worry. God's got a plan. Not sure 100%. Ultimately, what, what God tells Joshua says, take the Ark of the Covenant, let it go forward. And there's a beautiful story, which I can't go into, but the Ark of the Covenant went before, a thousand feet before the crowd, went in, and as they go to walk into the Jordan, literally, as the priests go to put their feet into the water, the water separates. Now, it's a river. It stops flowing, which is a similar miracle, you may remember, to the Red Sea. But the water somehow dams up. It's not like the Red Sea that is st stagnant. It's dynamic, and it stops, and they walk on dry ground. The only two people who had ever seen anything like this before was Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else had died. And, and I can sort of imagine, hey, remember this, Joshua? Remember this, Caleb? They were kind of probably having their own little conversation. But they walked on dry ground. But what happened is God told Joshua to do something. God told Joshua to do something. And I want to read about that right here in Joshua 4. It says this. Joshua 4, verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people. From each tribe, one man. From each tribe, 12, take one from each tribe. And command them saying, take 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan for the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Verse 4, then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, one man from each of the tribes. And Joshua said to him, pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, in the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you one stone upon his shoulder. Notice the size, on the shoulder, not a little stone. According to the number of the tribes of the people, that this may be a sign among you that this may be a sign among you. And when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And so these stones shall serve as a memorial to Israel forever. It shall stand as a memorial forever. Let me just backtrack just a minute here. 
you need to understand there's something very powerful that's happening here. But not only is it powerful, it's something that God actually speaks to each and every single one of us and was embedded into the culture of Christianity, embedded into the culture of Israel, the nation that followed God, the nation that's being talked to right now. It was embedded in there. What is happening here? All you have to do is go back to the writings of Moses back in Deuteronomy. And I want to go back in Deuteronomy for just a second. Chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is called the Shema. Shema is an actually, even Orthodox Jews to this day, quote this three times a day. It's a, it's a portion of scripture that is deeply embedded to the culture of Israel. It is vastly important. It is something that they quote in remembrance all the time. You'll see why. I can't read you the whole chapter. I'm just going to read you a couple verses. This is what it says. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You may remember similar words like that in the New Testament. And these words that I command you today, you shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall instruct them on purpose. There shall be intentional action with your children. Why? Because it's a generational conversation. And you shall talk to them when you sit in the house. Notice the locations. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, notice the physical, and you shall, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house. What is God doing here? He's teaching people that the way that you keep the Lord in front of you is by setting up memorials, by setting up memories in your life. And as you can look at these memories over the course of time, there's instruction that's happening. You have to remember there's no CNN. There's no people documenting things. There's no internet. The way that they passed on the story is verbally and generationally. There was a generational narrative that passed the story along of what? Of God's work in them and around them. This is what's happening. So in Deuteronomy, it says, listen, teach your children. Teach them diligently. This speaks of leadership, of influence. Speak. Speak to them. But it's not just children. It's leaders to influenced. Influencers to influenced. Why? So we can see the spiritual progress of what God is doing. It's a reminder lest we forget. A reminder lest we forget. So here Joshua is. He goes in. God tells him, set up a memorial. He assigns 12, 12 people, one from each tribe, to make sure that everybody has ownership in the process. And he goes through the river. They grab these stones. Notice, they put it on their shoulder. They go to the next place, and they put it down and serve a memorial. And Joshua says that this may be a memorial for your children to come so that when they ask... You can tell them what happened here. So that when they ask, you can recount the greatness of God. When they ask, you can recount the miracle that happened in this space. You can recount that you saw God work in your life. You saw God work. You physically saw that the river stopped and there was dry land. I always thought it was interesting. Why, why did he say that when children ask? In my mind's eye, I sort of, sort of remembered in my mind, I was like, well, maybe it's because when they were going to Thanksgiving and they're going along the Jordan, they're going down Thanksgiving to the parents, they go down to the Thanksgiving house, all of a sudden they ask about the memorial. But my question is, why would they know that that's the memorial? Well, notice that they're taking the rocks out of the river. I've actually been to this 
location in the Jordan. And if, and if you have seen pictures of it or have been there yourself, you'll understand that it's a very jagged territory. There's rocks everywhere, but they're, they're quite jagged. But what do we know about rocks that are actually come from the bottom of the river? They're round and they're smooth. So all of a sudden you got this pile of 12 rocks, a memorial. And as you're going to Thanksgiving, this is what I want you to do to your kids. When they, Mom, Mom what, what's up with that? What's up with that thing over there? Oh, sit down, sit down, sit down. I want you to sit down. Listen, let me tell you. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. Let me tell you what happened here. You know where those rocks came from? That river. What? I'm telling you, those rocks came from that river. From the middle, well, how did they get them? Let me tell you the story. It's unbelievable. For 40 years, we were in the wilderness. Grandpas, grandmas died. All these people died. Joshua said, we're crossing the river, grab 12 stones out of the river. When the Ark of the Covenant actually stepped into the river, the priest stepped in, the water stopped. Those rocks, son, those rocks came from that river, and I was there to see it. When was the last time God worked in your life? Do you have a story? Do you have, do you have a sensitivity that's to the point where you're like, I can't wait for somebody to ask me, when's the last time God worked in my life? I can't wait. I wish somebody would ask me right now. Or maybe it's even the struggle right now that you're in of trying to figure out, God, what are you doing in my life? What is happening in my life? Let me say it to you this way. <clears throat> Memorials help us remember. Memorial help, helps us remember. But there's something about, there's something about these memorials and remembering that is difficult in this world. There's actually agents in this world that are helping you forget. There are things that are working against you, things that are trying to get you to forget. There are things that are happening to you. Things, listen, things that you are seeking almost on a daily basis Things that you are seeking, that when you get into that space, it just erases. It's like spiritual amnesia. It's just forgetting. Do you remember that passage I just read to you in Deuteronomy about the kids? And it says, make sure you teach your kids. Make sure you, when you rise, when you walk, when you sleep, when you lie down, when you sit on the doorpost, on the frontlets, on your hand. Remember that? Here's the same portion of Scripture the next verse. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy, verse 10, 6, 10. And when the Lord God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's literally talking about the moment that they're in. <clears throat> swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, to give to you with great <clears throat> and good cities that you did not build. And houses full of good things that you did not fill. And cisterns that you did not dig. And vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and you are full, verse 12, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the land of slavery. Let me just spend a couple minutes right here. Verse 11, read the last part. It goes through all these things in verse 11. The houses that you get, your houses are full of stuff, the wells where you get your water are all dug out, all the vineyards and all the fruit and the plenty is there, all the plenty is there. And then after you're all settled in to your beautiful little spot and you're all comfortable and satisfied and you've eaten and you're in a space of comfort, then at that moment, take care. 
lest you forget. Let me say it to you this way. Memorials help us remember. Comfort helps us forget. Memorials help us remember. Physical reminders of what's happening spiritually in our life, they help us remember. But comfort helps us forget. When things get satisfied in our life, when things feel like they're under control and comfort has set in, when we're in our houses and we have everything that we need and everything seems to be there, you know, in their case, when the Lord has blessed and you are in that space, that's when you got to be careful. Because comfort is an aid in forgetfulness. Comfort actually helps us forget. You have to bring these things to the forefront. You have to constantly be in that space, remembering what God has done. Let me ask you, when was the last time God worked in your life? How comfortable are you? It's hard to remember, huh? You know when you're most sensitive to God working? <laughs> when you're not comfortable. That's when you're the most sensitive. When you're not settled and all comfortable and everything's not there, you're seeking God like you've never sought him before. That's why when people go on mission trips, they pray like mad. They go to a foreign country. They got anacondas and crocodiles rocking around and big tarantulas and stuff. They're praying like they've never prayed to God before in their life. Because all the comforts are gone. All the comforts are gone. See, comfort aids in forgetfulness. Comfort is, is actually an, an anesthetizer of, the, of what God is doing in our life. He's telling it to the Hebrews right here. He says, listen, when you get to that spot and you have all and you're living in there and you finally sit down at a table and you eat and you're satisfied, then that's the moment you got to be careful. So what do we take away from this? Well, stay uncomfortable. Stay uncomfortable. Like, doesn't that just grind you? Isn't the American dream life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Isn't that what we're all doing? Like, we got to, comfort is like, that's like the bullseye of the life I'm trying to find. And yet, Seeking that, putting your GPS on the comfort, putting your GPS on that thing that's going to, the, the comfort that's going to satisfy, that's going to finally settle you, is actually the very thing that pulls you away from your spiritual walk in life. Have you ever been at a point in time in your life where you're walking through your life and you're going, man, I got all this stuff, but I got to make a big decision. I got to make a big decision in my life. And I don't know what the decision, I don't even know where I need to go. I don't even know. God, please tell me what I need to do. Where do I need to go? Where's my journey? Where's my journey leading me? In which direction should I go? Lord God, I need you. Could you please tell me? You know one of the best ways, do you know one of the by far best ways to actually get out of the woods? I know. You get what? Get out of the woods? If you ever get lost in the woods, let me tell you how to get out, how do you get lost out of the woods? If you're in the woods and you don't know where you are and you're lost, typically what happens with most people is they die from exposure. What does that mean? That means they get to a point where all of a sudden they realize they don't know where they are, so they start picking up pace. As they pick up pace, especially in the fall or the winter, they start getting warm. As they start getting warm, they start shedding clothing. They run, they keep going, and typically what happens with most people is when they get lost in the woods is they actually travel in a circle. You literally many times can see how they're traveling because they've dropped 
water bottles, they've dropped clothing, they've dropped many of the things that many times are helpful for them to get out. But here's how you get out of the woods. If you're lost to the best of your ability, find the direction you need to go. Maybe you can look at a mountain ridge, maybe you can look at a stream, and here's what you do. You grab a tree, you find another tree, you line it up, you go to the next tree, you look back to that tree, You go to the next tree, you find another tree, you line it, and you line up trees one by one by one by one by one. Why? Because the shortest distance between two points is a what? Straight line. Well, I don't know what God's doing in my life. God, what do you want me to do next? I have no clue. Of course you don't, because you don't have memorials set up in your life. If you had memorials set up, over the course of years, weeks, months, and you saw how God was using you in the space, in, the, in your context, and you had these memorials, all you would have to do is kind of go, wow, you know what? It seems to be headed in, in that direction. It's not like there's a lot of choice. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go this way. Well, that doesn't make much sense. God's God's working, measuring God's work in our life, measuring, measuring, and by, by measuring, I mean like literally on our journey, setting up memorials so that we can remember what God's doing in life. And as leaders, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, this is what we need to be doing. People in church, where are we going? Setting up memorials is important to understand that God is actively involved in our life. He's doing something special. And so what's the goal? The goal is to stay uncomfortable. The goal is to stay uncomfortable in your life. To not try and seek that comfort that will actually eliminate your need to memorialize God's work. Stay uncomfortable and remember God in your life. How do we do this practically? Let's just go practical, brass tacks, practical. As an individual, there's many ways. You can journal. You can maybe open your Bible, and if God says something to you in a specific verse, you can write the date on the verse. There was something that happened in my life on that date. Maybe, maybe when you're going on a walk and you're doing something, you can pick up a rock. You can pick up something, right, that, re, that reminds you that. Put the date on the rock. Maybe you go through the fall and you're seeking God's face and you can pick up a beautiful leaf. You can take that leaf, put it, and remember that the reason why you picked up that leaf is because at that moment, I was talking, I was seeking an answer, and I felt like God gave me what I needed in that moment. That's a memorial. Practically speaking, that's how we do it. How do leaders do it? Leaders, leaders have to, leaders, influencers, you and your family, you in this church, what is God doing? Speaking about it, bringing it up, having a conversation, having a place where we can share it. We have all these little small groups, whether men's groups or women's groups or, or just couples groups, family groups. That's a place where we share what God is doing in our life. Why? Because it helps us remember. It helps us memorialize. It helps us put the hashtags on that doorway on the spiritual doorway of our life so that we can see that God is working and doing something in our life. He's present. Comfort isn't allowing us to forget. He's actually doing something. It is a command in Scripture to remember. When you are full, when you have eaten, don't forget. You need to grab Any gizmo you have, anything you can come up with in your mind can be a memorial. You got to do it. But you got to stay uncomfortable. As I was thinking about that idea of staying uncomfortable, it made me think of this. If I put a picture up of a nice sandy beach, there's something appealing to that, uh, to, to us. But you know what kind of struck me about a nice little sandy beach where the weather's beautiful 
where the, where the comfort of the waves are coming in and, this, and the warm sand on your, on your feet and the sun on you and you're in that space of comfortability is you can't build any Karens, any rock memorials on a sandy beach because there's no rocks. Which then made me think about Caleb and the story where it happens later in Joshua where Joshua and where, where Caleb's having a conversation and Caleb says, give me the rocky soil. And it kind of made me go, man, I wonder if, if Caleb asked for that rocky soil because he, he knew something. He knew that you can't build memorials on sandy beaches because comfort sets in and there's literally no rocks to build memorials with. In order to build memorials, you need rocks. As we transition in the service, it's interesting, we're gonna have communion right now. Let me just read you the portion of scripture connected to communion. I think now you'll find it interesting. I'm just gonna read it. Notice the words. Here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in, say the word. Say it like you mean it. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're gonna practice communion right now. If you don't have one of these and you need one, please raise your hand. We'll get you one. But let me say this to you. If you don't understand this, or this is inconsistent with your life, you don't really, this, this part does not express where you are in your walk, you don't have to do this. There's no pressure to do this. In fact, I would say this, if you've never really professed your belief in Jesus Christ, this is really, it's hard to remember something that you've never done. So let that be an invitation to you. If you're here today and you've never, never, never really put your faith in Jesus Christ, in the death, burial, and resurrection of what he did. Come down here after the service. There will be people here. We would love to pray with you and help you understand what this passage means to those of us who have committed and given our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is a memorial that we have been living for thousands of years Remembering what God did for us way back when so that we could have life. Take a moment, believer, and reflect. Take a moment and remember the greatness of God in your life that started with his death on the cross to redeem you specifically. Take a moment to think about that and we'll get right to this. You can take the wafer out. Let me read verse 23. For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until I come. Let me end with a phrase here. They're going to put it up on screen. Our spiritual progress can only be seen where we have been and what God has done. That's, that answers your question. How do we measure God's work in our life? The only way to see and measure what God is doing in your life is by setting up memorials of what God has done in your life over the course of time. So go. Set up memorials. Influence other. To set up memorials of God's work in your life because he's alive, he's well, he's working in you today. Remember him and stay uncomfortable. Thank you. You are dismissed. If you like prayer, we will have people up here to pray with you.